The United States is drowning in $35 trillion in national debt. If we compare this to the country's GDP, it's about 125% of their GDP. It's estimated that the U.S. government will pay around $892 billion in interest this year. To put this into perspective, in fiscal year 2024, the U.S. government collected $4.08 trillion in revenue, meaning that 22% of that revenue will be spent solely on paying interest. And with the way the U.S. continues to borrow, it's projected that over the next decade, the country will end up paying $12.9 trillion in interest alone. So the big question is, can the U.S. actually manage these payments? While it might be able to keep up with the interest, repaying the principal seems far out of reach. But here's something interesting to think about. If every country in the world was asked to pay off its debt entirely, how many do you think would default? 50%, 70%, 80%? Actually, the answer is 100%. That's right. There isn't a single country that could fully repay its debt because there's more debt in the world than actual money. Surprising, right? In this video, I'll break down the nature of our debt-based monetary system and how the U.S. is exploiting it, which ultimately affects the rest of the world. I'm also going to share the surprising truth about modern money creation. But first, let's rewind a bit. Trade has been an essential part of human civilization for thousands of years, with the barter system being one of the earliest forms. In this system, people traded goods and services based on mutual need, but the barter system had its flaws. It was extremely inefficient. For example, imagine someone who makes tents but needs a pair of shoes. Should they trade an entire tent just for one pair of shoes? Clearly, this was not a practical way to trade. Because of this, a new concept of medium of exchange emerged. Initially, it wasn't what we now know as money. The first form of this medium was seashells. Instead of trading goods directly, people could exchange shells to make a transaction. The problem, though, was that shells were too common. You could just pick one off a beach and use it as currency. So humans tried using cattle, grains, and other items, but none were perfect. You could breed more cattle or grow more grain, making them unreliable as a currency. What was needed was something rare and valuable, which is how gold became the ultimate form of money. Gold was rare and couldn't be created by people, so it became the standard for trade. Over time, gold was minted into coins and international trade began to flourish. But as trade grew, gold became inconvenient, especially for large transactions. Transporting large amounts of gold over long distances was both difficult and risky. To solve this, the use of receipts or paper money emerged. For example, instead of handing over 1,000 grams of gold to another trader, people started using receipts that stated the equivalent value of gold was reserved for them in a specific vault. The value still lay in the gold, but now paper receipts made trading easier. Eventually, every country created its own currency, and by 1873, these currencies were backed by gold. This meant if you had $20, you could exchange it for $20 worth of gold at the bank. This system lasted for about 40 years, but in 1914, World War I broke out and everything changed. Many key nations were drawn into the conflict, and the costs of war skyrocketed. Governments needed more money than they had available, so they came up with a solution. Before the war, $20 in paper money was backed by $20 in gold. But during the war, countries like the U.S. realized they didn't need physical gold to fund their spending. The gold stayed in the vaults, and only paper money was circulated. This led to a new system, known as the gold exchange standard, where currencies were only partially backed by gold. So for example, $50 worth of paper money might only be backed by $20 of gold. This allowed countries to print more money to finance their war efforts. Then in 1939, World War II broke out, leading to even more economic upheaval. Here's an interesting point about wars. Countries involved in them often shift all their resources toward winning the war, which means they import their everyday goods from other nations. The U.S., having joined both world wars late, primarily exported goods to European countries in need of supplies. Since international trade was done in gold, by the end of World War II, the U.S. had accumulated two-thirds of the world's gold reserves. Meanwhile, Europe and other countries were left with only a fraction of the world's gold and a lot of U.S. dollars from loans taken during the war. This set the stage for a new monetary system, the Bretton Woods system. Under Bretton Woods, other currencies were no longer directly backed by gold. Instead, they were backed by the U.S. dollar, which could be exchanged for gold at $35 per ounce. This system solidified the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. For the next two decades, the U.S. took full advantage of the Bretton Woods system. Post-World War II, the U.S. funded numerous conflicts, including the Korean War and the Vietnam War, by printing more dollars. 
With global trade happening in dollars, the U.S. could print as much money as it needed, exporting these dollars to its allies. Over time, the U.S. printed more dollars than it had in gold reserves, knowing that most countries wouldn't demand their gold in return. But then, France's president Charles de Gaulle called out the U.S., accusing it of deceiving the world. He emphasized that the value lay in gold, not in U.S. dollars, and France began withdrawing its gold from the U.S. In response, other nations followed suit. By 1971, the U.S. had lost 50% of its gold reserves, and the U.S. government panicked. On August 15, 1971, President Richard Nixon announced a major change. The U.S. dollar would no longer be redeemable for gold, introducing a new system called the dollar standard. From then on, global currencies became fiat money, backed by nothing but trust in the government that issued them. This leads us to our current system. In today's world, debt is intrinsic to the monetary system. To explain this further, let's look at how money is created. In the U.S., the process involves two main entities, the government, represented by the Treasury, and the central bank, known as the Federal Reserve. Whenever the U.S. government needs money, it issues bonds equivalent to the required amount. For instance, if the government needs $1 trillion, it will issue $1 trillion in Treasury bonds, which the Federal Reserve will purchase by printing dollars. These printed dollars are known as base money. Now, when people receive these dollars, they deposit them in banks. The banks, following a reserve ratio system, keep a portion of the deposit, let's say 10%, and lend out the rest. This creates new money in the form of loans. Over time, this process creates more money, but it also means the national debt continues to grow because the money supply is debt-based. Here's the kicker. After the 1971 shift, U.S. dollars lost their gold backing and became backed by government bonds, essentially debt. The U.S. government pays interest on this debt using tax revenue. And since the U.S. can print more money, it doesn't need to pay off the principal amount, but the interest burden keeps growing, shouldered by taxpayers. Given that the U.S. dollar is still the world's reserve currency, when the U.S. prints more dollars, inflation is effectively exported to the rest of the world. The sheer amount of dollars in circulation devalues the currency over time. For example, since 1971, the U.S. dollar has lost 98% of its value. However, the global landscape is changing. Countries like China are moving away from the U.S. dollar, stockpiling gold, and conducting more trade in their local currencies. Various groups such as BRICS have also started to trade in non-dollar currencies. Most notably, oil arguably the world's most important commodity, is increasingly being traded in currencies other than the dollar. In the past 80 years, the U.S. has leveraged its position to dominate the global economy. But this era might be drawing to a close. So now you understand how the global economy may be shifting away from the U.S. dollar. Regarding a recent groundbreaking development, scientists have successfully created a mini-brain which I have explained in detail in a previous video that you can watch here. I highly recommend it as one of our most interesting videos. If you learned something new from this video, please give it a like. And if you have more questions, subscribe to the channel as we'll bring answers to your queries.